great. Okay, we allow the people. We'll go, we are going live now. Hi all, thanks for joining. We'll give a minute for others to join. We are still a minute to go for the official start of this webinar. Please be on hold, we'll start soon. Good morning. We'll get started. Warm welcome to you all. This webinar is being sponsored by Wellington, and we are looking for an exciting webinar today. My name is Santosh Joshi, Director of Events at PMI Island Chapter, and I will be your host today. This webinar is being recorded for the future reference. The role of PMO is evolving very fast. At this speed of change, what the future will look like for the PMOs and how the PMOs can innovate, what tactics the PMOs can use to drive change in the organization. All your questions will be answered today by an industry expert who is with us today. You can also ask your questions in the chat box. To introduce the speaker, I would like to Invite Yuraj Venugopal, who is a key member of the event management group, and he himself is a project and a program management professional with a vast experience in driving the projects. Yuraj, over to you to introduce the speaker. Thanks, Santosh. A very good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Ireland chapter of PMI. Uh, today, I'm delighted to welcome Emma. Emma Rudd is the Director of Consulting Services and a CSR Lead at Wellington. She's a project, program, and portfolio specialist with extensive experience in the change management industry with a particular focus on collaboration, PMO conception and strategy, method, and capability development. She is APM PMO SIG Committee Chairperson. She's also APM Accredited Trainer, P3 M3 Assessor, NLP Master Practitioner, to name a few among the list. Emma, thanks a million for joining us today. And now I'll hand over to Emma. Amazing, thank you for that introduction. And welcome everybody. Uh, good morning. <laughs> You're all here very early this morning. Uh, so, um, as the guy said, my name is uh, Emma Ruth Arnaf Pemberton. Uh, I'm the Director of Consulting Services at Wellington, and I look after sustainability and corporate social responsibility, which means that I get to work with some great companies that are trying to bring project management into social good. Uh, I also look after um, our future PMO conference. So we run a conference every year that brings PMO and project management professionals together to kind of learn, share and grow about what's going on in the industry, uh, as well as their own personal development. And you can follow me on social media if you look for PMO Ninjas. We'll talk more about what it takes to be a PMO Ninja in a while. In case you haven't heard about Wellington, we're a project management consultancy firm. We have offices uh, in the UK, in Windsor, where I'm based, uh, in Dublin, and also in Madrid, in Spain. And our mission is to enable our clients to make a step change in their project management maturity. And we do that through a variety of different services, which include technology, consultancy, and training. Today, we're gonna to talk about the PMO. We're gonna look at uh, the role of the PMO and how it's changed over the years. And we're gonna take you through that journey whilst exploring what the future looks like and maybe some areas that you can innovate in that you maybe didn't consider before because they're going to be important in the future. So in terms of our agenda items, we're gonna explore the journey first. We can't really know where we're going until we know where we've been. Uh, we're going to understand what successful innovation looks like, so how organisations have managed to successfully innovate. Uh, we're going to identify some of these topics to consider that you might not have thought of before. And we're going to learn some tactics to get you ready uh, for your future PMO. 
Um, as the guy said, um, feel free to use the chat. Um, I am going to, we are going to be keeping an eye on that today uh, just to kind of see if there's any questions or any comments along the way. Uh, so do, don't be shy. Do feel free to put stuff in there. Uh, and at the end, we'll go through those questions and see if we can give you any help that we can uh, or answer any queries that you might have. So let's get straight into it, talking about the journey of the PMO. As I said, I'm a firm believer that we can't really know where we're going until we know where we've been. And the PMO industry has fundamentally changed uh, since it's kind of been around, if you like. Uh, the PMO industry uh, started out kind of in a really technical, technically focused approach, I guess you could say. So we really saw the first PMOs popping up in defence, government, manufacturing specific organisations, and they had a very technical focus. So the original PMOs were what one might call these days a tick in the box kind of function. We were really there to make sure that um, the part had been developed correctly, had been designed correctly, had been created, uh, had been tested, making sure that it had been packaged and shipped out to the customer. Um, so really focusing in on the technical aspects of delivery as opposed to the project management side. So those of you who maybe have some stakeholders who are still challenging the value of PMO, kind of saying these words like, well, it's just a tick in the box, it's an admin function. They're not wrong. It's just that maybe they've been brought up in a slightly different PMO than you've been exposed to, that technically focused PMO. As the PMO started to evolve, uh, we became a lot more outputs focused. And the tr one of the triggers for that was that kind of iron triangle, the triple constraint of time, cost, quality. It's an oldie, but it's a goodie. Uh, it still works. Um, nowadays, we tend to say if you hit two out of the three, you're doing pretty well. But with that came some internal customers where people were asking us from internally in the organization, um, how are you getting on with that project? Are you delivering to time cost quality? So we suddenly became a lot more focused on the time, the cost and the quality of the output that these projects were delivering. So we'd started to evolve into more like the PMOs that we see today. Next, the PMOs became a lot more outcomes focused. So we had program offices that suddenly were popping up when organizations realized that they had challenges and opportunities that they needed to address. So things started to get grouped together. We started to see some transformation initiatives within organizations. And with that came the concept of critical success criteria and our external customers, people outside of our business started asking, how you're getting on with those projects with that transformation program. Next, the PMO became a lot more strategic. Uh, so everybody wanted to be a strategic portfolio office. Nobody really knew what it meant, but it sounded really sexy. So everybody wanted one anyway. And this was when the PMO was more focused on benefits. Suddenly our sponsors had to understand return on investment. Uh, the financial crisis happened around this point back in 2008, uh, 2007, 2008. So we had the organizational context to consider coming from a PMO perspective. Was our organization growing? Was it re um, retaining cash flow uh, so that, you know, to, to kind of get through that crisis? So we became a lot more strategic. We became a lot more ruthless, a little bit like ninjas in the background to identify what were the value adding activities that we could actually deliver with with whilst still focusing in on that return on investment those benefits and that benefits realization management and then the PMO started to evolve again and now we see PMOs there are a lot more people focused so now we have various methodologies that we need to consider it's not just about the traditional project program and portfolios it's also about the agile project management approach it's also about lean six sigma change management is becoming more important and coming down the pipeline something brand new that some of you might not even have heard of yet is called project management bricolage a new way of delivering our projects so we now have various disciplines and methodologies that we need to consider and along with that has come that people and change focus. It's really important nowadays, particularly after the last couple of years where we're now working in a dispersed fashion, people are still working from home. Uh, it's more important now than ever to focus on our people, both in terms of their output, but also in terms of their wellness and their ability to deliver confidently in a situation that they might not feel 100% comfortable within. 
We cannot assume that people working from home have had a really enriching and fulfilling experience. So it's important for our PMOs to really drill down and be focused on how are our people doing and that they're working in a safe space, a safe space where they can develop both professionally and personally. Um, and so this journey that PMO has been on is actually calling, if you can see here, to PMOs that are unrecognisable in many ways from where PMOs actually started. That's what makes this a really, really exciting industry, uh, because it means that depending on the skill set of the teams, depending on the organisational context, depending on the environment that the PMO is working within, we get a slightly different result every time. Rule number one of PMO is there is no one size fits all. There isn't a book that we can say, apply this and it will magically work. It always needs to be tailored to the environment, to the organisation and to the people within it. During the introduction, the guys mentioned about the fact that I, I coach. So I do life coaching and cognitive behavioural therapy and NLP coaching as well. That's a personal interest that I've been able to bring to all of my PMOs. All of my PMOs that I've worked within have always had a pretty strong coaching and mentoring because that's part of the team that I build and the interests of the team that sit within the PMO. So you can make your PMO whatever you need it to be as an organisation. And that's a really important point. It's not about you as an individual deciding. It's about looking at what the organisation needs. And sometimes it needs that more technical focused PMO. And other times it needs more, something more along that strategy and people. So understanding the nature of your PMO is a really important step when you're either setting up a PMO from scratch or developing or redeveloping, transforming a PMO that you already have. So hopefully that's given you a little bit of a whistle stop tour on uh, the journey that PMO has been on. And um, now we, I'm going to just show you some of the statistics around PMO and how PMOs have been adopted. Now at Wellington, we do research every year. We call it the State of Project Management Survey. And uh, we have some stats here from, uh, from the, some of the ones that we've done in the past. Now we can see that a lot of PMOs, 64% in fact, believe that they're operating at level two or three out of five. So if we look at maturity levels, usually there are five. Um, zero or one is kind of you know very ad hoc project management maybe it's being driven by one or two individuals uh, but certainly nothing written down nothing that's kind of standardized at level two we tend to find pockets of excellence in organizations so we tend to find that we do have some things written down probably they're not mandatory in terms of their use uh, and there'll be some teams that are using it very proficiently and other teams who are kind of still doing project management in the way they want to do it. At level three we start to see that actually all of our processes and guidance are, are designed. We usually see a PMO at this point and that PMO is doing some limited education so they're not just focused on the mechanics of PMO and, and project management, they're actually focused on uh, making sure that we're driving that capability. So most PMOs believe that they're in between those two levels. So, you know, either we have pockets of excellence that are kind of using some of the things we've written down, or we've actually got a PMO that's really dry, starting to drive that culture of change. When we ask them how satisfied they are, 32% of people say that they're satisfied with their current level of maturity. So that's quite a big gap that we need to fix or fill in terms of maturity for organisations. So it'll be interesting um, maybe in the chat to see where you currently think you sit. If you, you know, five is continuous improvement and all the PMO being very strategic, where do you think you sit on that scale? And are you satisfied with that? Now, when we look at PMOs, we know that the majority of organisations, in fact, over 80% of organisations now say that they have at least one or more PMOs. But when we ask that question around value, 
the perception and value of the PMO as a business partner, as a team that's bringing genuine value to what we do, we can see in 2020, 72% of those organizations that had a PMO say that they are delivering value. And that's been a huge step in terms of from before, which was 2018 that, that we have here, which was less than 50% of PMOs saying that actually they were respected as a business partner. In 2021, uh, we had new results and that actually that figure that came down a little bit. And the reason for that is COVID. During the pandemic, there were many PMOs that were actually disbanded. In 2020, in fact, KPMG and the International Project Management Association did a new survey. And one of the questions that they asked was, have you disbanded a PMO in the last year? 30% of respondents said that they had. And the reason that they had was around value. So we starting to see straight away that question of that perception of value and perception is very unique. It's very much down to the individual or the team to decide. So PMOs do need to get better at kind of demonstrating and articulating the value that they have. And like I said, in the PMO, we did see that lots of uh, during the pandemic, sorry, we did see lots of PMOs that got furloughed and or got disbanded completely. In some cases, the role of the PMO fundamentally changed. It went from maybe doing some of that people stuff and that strategic work and became a very tactical function, kind of grabbing data and trying to get insights for people because we people couldn't just walk down the corridor and see how their teams were getting on. So it's really important that we understand this delta between, yes, lots of organisations have PMOs, but we still need to make sure that we are demonstrating and articulating and are willing and able to talk about the value that we bring as a team to the organization out loud. And that's really important. We're not great at communicating how the amazing things that our PMOs do in our PMO industry, and we need to get much better at that. So that's my first challenge to you is get out there and start talking about what it is that you do. So let's have a look at some organizations that have kind of made it, some could say. So some organizations that have really innovated in the way that they approach project management practice within their organizations, and they've you know, made a significant step change in maturity. Now, we're not able to put the company names on here, uh, but we can see you know, we've got three different sectors. So the first one is an organization that works in the retail sector. Things that they did that were different to a lot of other PMOs was they created a global community infrastructure. What does that mean? That means that globally across the organization, they were able to create a community of practice, a true community of practice where people, project managers, people who were interested in PMO, doesn't have to be an ex a, 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 a exclusive club. Um, we're able to come together regularly for learning events, uh, for sharing best practice, and they even had a career path that included project management and PMO. So anybody in the business who was interested in project management could put their hand up and genuinely start working through that career path using the infrastructure that was there and available to them. They also made their community subscribable, which is quite rare. You don't see it very often where people actually subscribe, just like you maybe do to some newsletters that you get via email. So they actually had subscriber based events, meaning that the people who attended were actually active participants. They wanted to be in the room. In fact, their approach, the PMO's approach to project management training was following your onboarding, we will not put you in a room unless you choose to be there. So it was very much about putting the onus and making people accountable for their own delivery. If you find a gap in your knowledge, then it's up to you to come to us and we can set something up. So it was really important to drive that culture from the top down. The line managers, they had to give people the time and the headspace to be able to go and do that training, to go and attend those learning events. They also had a self-service reporting portal, something that is still a little bit elusive in some organizations. You know, people love a nice reporting pack that makes a lovely sound when it lands on my desk. Um, and what they did is rather than just put it online, they actually made it self-service. So they really pushed for the leadership to go and 
be responsible and accountable for their approach and their knowledge of change and project management in the business. So they really put the onus on the people and made it very much a pull relationship rather than what happens a lot of the time, which is a push relationship. Here is a report. Here's an event you need to come to. Here's a workshop. Here's some templates. Very much working together. And as an organization, they were globally recognized by various associations. And they did a lot of um, speaking at conferences and events to talk about some of the tooling and the approach that they had actually been able to apply at a global scale, which is, again, quite unusual. The next uh, uh, the next example that we have was in the manufacturing industry. So it is possible to do pretty much no matter what industry you're working within. Now, manufacturing uh, isn't necessarily a very project focused organization it's very much that industry is very much focused on output and getting things out but again one of the things that they did that was innovative for them was they created a communications based portal so the PMO owned a portal that was all about communications that meant that people could come and again self-serve to some degree in terms of what was going on in the industry uh, in the organization and the wider industry so they did open that communications out to what else is going on that might be of interest so free webinars such as this they actually opened and gave people the time and the space to go and learn from somebody else as well that communications portal had lots of information on there around what was going on with the specific projects they trained their pmo people to be skilled at writing articles and blogs so that information was constantly available on a daily basis they they kind of targeted uh, to get new information out there they designed some tooling as well so they had some project management tooling that kind of really dovetailed into that approach of making things self-service so that people could understand the, and be guided on how to deliver projects so those people who maybe weren't experienced project managers they weren't starting with a blank sheet of paper they were actually starting with a guide a system that would help them to get from one step to the next to the next they completely redesigned their governance structures. This is an organization that is made up of various companies. So you can imagine if you have 21 MDs, you have 21 CEOs, you have 21 HR departments, uh, prioritization can be quite tricky. Everybody thinks that theirs is a priority one. So they completely redesigned their governance structures to be able to have what we would say grown up conversations. So we appreciate it's your number one priority, but looking at everything that we have in place, actually you're number four. So really kind of looking at how do we bring people together from a governance perspective so that we can have these grown up conversations and make real uh, value adding decisions for the future of the organizations. Because they had various companies that sat within uh, the organization that the PMO was kind of responsible for working with, they also appointed what they called conduit partners. And these are the people who would sit in the business, but would have that dotted line into that central PMO so that they kind of were our translators, if you like. So really kind of looking at speaking the language of that particular company, really making sure that they understood what the challenges and the opportunities were in that company so that those prioritization decisions made sense. And those conduit partners were absolutely key in kind of getting those companies on board with the changes and the fact that it was no longer going to be a situation where who shouts loudest gets the resource first. One of the, the big things that, that happened for these guys is KPMG audited them every year and they had a significant uplift that was purely put down to the impact that the PMO had had by bringing in these new structures. So they actually saw from an audit perspective a, a massive leap um, in terms of their project management practice. So it is, again, possible to really make a difference to how the organization is perceived, whether it's by its people or these external auditors. And then if we look at public sector, so in public sector, this was uh, a different kind of PMO, uh, but they also created that community based operating model. So you're starting probably to see a little bit of a theme here. Um, and if you think back to the history of PMO, maybe you're seeing where some of the more modern approaches are coming from. So that community based operating model was really, really important in the public sector, really making sure that we are taking 
all of the knowledge that exists in public sector, you know, we do have lots of people who maybe have been working in the same role or certainly in the same department for a very long time. And so they have a lot of what we call tacit knowledge in their heads. Um, and that knowledge isn't written down anywhere. It's not really knowledge that we can necessarily codify easily. We can't write it down easily. We can't create a process flow. It's a little bit like if we ask if you can ride a bike and you have to tell somebody without teaching them how to ride a bike. It's something that you just know how to do. And it's actually really hard to explain how to do it without having a bike in front of you. Uh, and that tacit knowledge is really important. The concept of knowledge management is something that uh, is becoming again more and more important as people move in organizations, people retire from from positions. And in the public sector, this is something that is quite prevalent uh, because, like I say, we do have a long a lot of lifers, as, as, as some people call them. So having that community based operating model for them really, really help them in terms of bringing those people together and sharing that those experiences, getting that tacit knowledge out of people's heads uh, before they kind of go off onto their new next adventure so that everybody can benefit from that knowledge. Those people, uh, I always, my example is always Bob. So every company has at least a Bob in them. Bob has been around forever. He's really knowledgeable. He knows everybody. He has a brilliant network. So everybody wants Bob to work within their project because he, he just brings lots of experience, lots of knowledge. He can say, we did this a few years ago. This is why it didn't work. Everybody wants the value of that experience in their work. So you need to identify your Bobs and do what this company did kind of that community based portal so we can get all that knowledge out of Bob's head and actually put it in other people's heads. They also created an outcome based service model. So their PMO was really focused on delivering a set of services that their internal customers could use and really focused on what's the outcome if you utilize these services. So it might be assurance, risk management, finance management, maybe resource. Uh, maybe looking at kind of the wider communications piece and really helping projects and programs to deliver utilizing their services in a much more of a pull situation again. So really encouraging people and letting them see and feel the benefit of working with the PMO and not working around the PMO, which we still see in a lot of organizations. They also created a PMO portal gateway, uh, which was an online uh, toolkit, which allowed anybody in the business to go in and find out everything they wanted about PMO. So they could really kind of go in and find out what on earth this team do, because it's still not very well known. Um, and that's where all the resources were. Again, they plugged a lot of time into communications and change management to give people access easily to information that was going to help them. They also brought in dedicated change specialists and change management is something that is more and more important the more we focus on people. If we think about the role of PMO, we are affecting change whilst in some cases also being affected by the change. Um, so having change specialists within the PMO is a really good idea. We need to make sure that we're not subjecting people to change fatigue. We need to make sure that the changes that we are affecting are we are affecting in a positive way and that we are helping people to feel comfortable in that that new space whatever that new world that new process that new training looks like that we're giving people the knowledge the ability and the reinforcement to support them to be able to work in that way and these won awards so um so you know there are pmo awards out there there are a few different ones um but the work that the, these guys did within the public sector they were able to really kind of um hone in on something that was quite different in that sector and they actually were able to to win an award um a, a globally recognized award award so it is possible successful innovation there is there you will have seen some themes coming out in there and the word i'm going to say is community and communication uh, and again we're not great at pmo at talking widely about the good things that we do we need to get better at that because that is one of the key things that is now bringing high performing pmos to the forefront so let's have a look at how you can translate this to uh, your PMO and some of the areas that you might think about innovating that maybe you didn't think about before. 
that C word community, super important. Uh, one of the things I always talk about in my PMO courses is that we have customers and we need to treat our stakeholders, our sponsors, our project managers as customers. The minute you do that, you reframe your whole relationship with those people. And that's where community comes from. It's about giving our customers a place where they can find the knowledge that they need, where they can share their experiences and we can collaborate with them to improve things together. A lot of PMOs come through my courses and they say the, P the project managers won't do what I tell them to do. Well, that's not really the relationship that we expect PMOs to have with their customers now. Your organization probably wouldn't go to market with a new product without doing some market research. Our PMOs need to take this very same approach and work with their customers to make sure that whatever whatever we are changing, we are doing it A, for the right reasons and B, in the right way. And also at the same time at the right time considering everything else that's going on so building a community infrastructure when i set up pmos it's always my last output if you like the last tick in the box that i think that's the thing that needs to be in place before i leave because that's what's going to make pmos successful because then it isn't just you and maybe a couple of other people in your team who are kind of trying to do everything it actually brings everybody together and everybody uh, wants to work in that way, giving everybody the desire to be part of that change. A colleague of mine always says, no one destroys what one helps to build. So bring your customers along your journey, because if they feel it's theirs, they're less likely to destroy it and not use it. Next, we need to think about capability. Um, one of the things that we've seen during the COVID pandemic is a huge uptake in online learning. Um, We've seen over 400% uptake uh, if we look at companies like Udemy um, and LinkedIn Learning in terms of people who actually had and, and took the time to learn something new. That's really great uh, from an individual perspective, but it also comes with risks and things that we need to be aware of from a PMO perspective and a, and a team perspective, not just PMOs. Firstly, um, a lot of the courses uh, and learning opportunities that have popped up haven't been validated. So, you know, where we give people access to LinkedIn, some of that content is opinion based. It hasn't been looked at. It hasn't it isn't necessarily something that has been independently validated. So we do need to be very careful in the same way that historically we would have gone through some kind of process to identify the right training provider for our organization for that person or set of people and actually what has happened is with that massive uptake we have lots of people coming back into the business who are now saying things like oh i'm an expert in this because they've done like a one hour course so that's a real risk for us because we don't have the ability to kind of test that knowledge so from a PMO's perspective one of the things that's really helping is to implement um, project-based learning project based learning is where people go and they do a course and rather than just kind of come back and say i'm an expert in this now um we actually give them the time to deliver a project utilizing the skills that they have so giving them some real life experience on how to utilize those skills this is one of the ways that we can kind of put in a little bit of a safety net to make sure that the learning that that person or that team has taken from whatever course they've done is actually going to add value to the organization and we can straight away then see through that project return on investment of that time that they went and did that that piece of work or that piece of learning and also we can really isolate the areas that are going to add value to our organization it also helps us to weed out the things that maybe were a little bit opinion based and very much about you know one company or one person's experience so we do need to be very mindful of the quality of learning that we're bringing back into the business it's great that companies are giving people the chance to learn we just need to get better at kind of harnessing the return on that investment also we should be encouraging reflective practice as human professional adults we're not very good at this we're most of us are time poor, so we don't actually take a step back very often and kind of just sit down and go, OK, what did I learn? How can I apply it? What would I do differently? Is there anything I would stop doing? Is there anything that isn't going to work in my reality? Is there anything that surprised me from that? So really encouraging people to do that reflective practice. And with that, one of the key things that helps us to build resilience as individuals and teams is the concept of critical thinking. So not just blindly applying everything that we read, but really kind of understanding 
how is it going to add value both to my organization and my customers, my internal PMO customers, to really make sure that we are delivering a set of services that are actually going to help people. They're not just going to add more the concept of bureaucracy. Next, we need to innovate in our governance space. So really thinking about the last two years, one of the things that we've seen is lots of projects continuing without all of the governance touch points that we would have had had we all been in the office. So, uh, you know, all those eight or 10 touch points with PMO, chances are we've skipped a few of those. And you know what? Projects have still delivered. So this is an, an interesting space in which to think about <clears throat> innovating. First of all, we need to think about something that's scalable. So really looking at categorizing the work that we are about to do. So right before we start is actually understanding what is the nature of this activity? Does it need governance? And how much governance does it actually need? Because one of the things we found over the last couple of years is that not everything needs every single stage and every single document and every single governance touch point that your PMO has been working with before. So maybe kind of looking at it from a categorization of, from the nature of the work is going to help us to get maybe a slightly different perspective. Also, how we prioritize needs to change. So again, this is maybe one of the areas that you might consider innovating in. So looking at your organizational context, are you using the right triggers, the right questions to prioritize your projects in the, in the best possible way? Or are we still in that world of who shouts loudest uh, or everybody just gets in a room and it's kind of a little bit of a bun fight? Pragmatism is key when it comes to our governance structures at the moment. We're still not all just working back in the office necessarily. Uh, we're still not all able to get in a room together as often as we did. So reviewing our governance and taking a pragmatic approach to what do we actually need as a PMO to really do our job? Now, data is more valuable than gold right now. So it's really tempting to grab as much data as we can from the projects and the programs and the rest of the business. The reality is out of all this data, we probably need that amount in order to actually do our job as a PMO. But it is really tempting to grab as much of that data as possible. So choose what you're going to measure wisely, not kind of uh, one of the key lessons that always stayed with me is um, um, measure what's important. Don't make important what you can measure. And that leads us to our standards. So what does our life cycle look like right now for our projects? Do we have various life cycles using various different methodologies? Again, we need to take a pragmatic view right now and look at how scalable is it? Again, if our project is very small and doesn't require all the governance, then probably it doesn't need all of those deliverables that we have attached to our life cycle. So we need to make our, our standards more scalable. We need to make sure that we're not trying to, you know, crack a, a walnut with a sledgehammer every time. Not every project requires everything. And it's really interesting what happens when you do that. Your project teams, your delivery teams will be much more open to sharing and working with the PMO because some of the smaller stuff they can kind of get on with and they have a little bit more autonomy. And then the bigger stuff that needs that sledgehammer, that needs all the governance, that needs all the stages, they understand why they need that. So actually, you tend to get a lot more engagement. Also, we need to make our standards simpler and clearer. Now that people are working um, in a dispersed fashion still, we need to make sure that we are a we are accounting for the fact that they can't just can't come and knock on the door necessarily. So making things as simple, as clear and accessible as possible is a key way to help our teams to innovatively kind of put information and support people through their journey. And a network, building partnerships around the organization. So as a PMO, you have more access in the organization than most other teams. So really start to think about building good, positive, beneficial partnerships with other teams in the organization. You might need to do a little bit of negotiation as well in terms of, you know, making things a two way street. If you do want a different department to work closely with you, do be ready to do negotiation. 
and consider doing some benchmarking. That's something that I do with a lot of um, a lot of my PMOs um, is actually do some benchmarking with other organizations in their industry. And the reason that we do that is because actually in many cases there are some quick wins, some things that we can apply that are kind of proven to work in other organizations in a similar industry that they could do quite quickly. So really think about the opportunity of benchmarking with other organizations in your industry. And we're almost at the end and I haven't seen any questions pop up in the chat. So do start popping those questions in so we can deal with them uh, in, a, in a while. Uh, and whilst I, I wait for you to do that, let's talk about what you can do to get future ready. So first of all, you need to reflect and identify, do some of that reflective practice that we don't often do and identify what are the strengths of your PMO right now? Where are you weak? What opportunities do you have available to you right now that would help you to kind of transform uh, or, um, or set up a PMO if you don't have anything right now? Next, you need to understand what value means to your customers. Uh, not to you, because your view will be different to your customers, but understand what value means to the organization and to the people within it. And it might be that their view is different to yours, and that's OK. And that doesn't necessarily mean we're going to give them everything they ask for, but at least we know and we can make informed decisions on how we transform our PMO and how we evolve over time. Interestingly, I did a conference, a, a benefits management conference um, a, a few years ago now, and um, one of the questions that I asked the group was kind of, we, they had big sheets of paper and I asked them to write down what value means to their organizations. And we counted, we had like 38 different organizations and we had 52 different perceptions of value. So straight away, we can see that depending on the role, depending on the company, depending on the industry, depending on the people, they will have a different perception of what value means to them. And we need to be cognizant of that. This is one of the areas that helps us to become more ninja like kind of a little bit stealthy to understand more about our customers so that we can make sure that we are adding value. Next, we want to create some profiles. So we need to understand the kind of projects that we have, the nature of the projects that we have, and also the kind of customer base that we have as a PMO. So we need to do some uh, uh, some insights gathering, uh, some might call it, to really kind of understand what are the nature of the projects that we're doing this for and who are the people who are delivering those projects or sponsoring or contributing to those projects that we need to really think about. So don't be afraid to create profiles and group people and projects so that you can then pragmatically look at both how you're going to deliver those, but also how you're going to communicate and engage with those people. Do a PMO MOT. So uh, if, if you have a car, an MOT is a, an annual thing that you have to do for cars over three years old. They kind of look all over the car and make sure that everything's OK. Um, and it will come out and say, oh, you're tired. You maybe need new tires or your brake pads need changing usually uh, or you have a light bulb that needs replacing. So do a PMO MOT. And in a second, I will give you a link so that you can do a PMO MOT for free. Uh, and it is just a very simple form and it will kind of give you a view on some of the areas that maybe your PMO requires some attention. And then lastly, um, develop a roadmap. There is a lot to be said for writing things down. In fact, the human brain is designed to remember things more once we actually write them down and physically interact with our ideas. So one of the key things that we need to do is sit down as a team and develop a roadmap. Once we know who it is that, what our strengths and weaknesses are, who it is we're doing this for, once we understand value, we understand what our MOT looks like, is actually developing a roadmap for the next year, 18 months, we never really look any further than 18 months when we develop roadmaps, um, just simply because the world changes. <laughs> so make sure you develop a roadmap and you write down what it is you think you can achieve. And be mindful of the concept of optimism bias, that the human condition uh, means that we are we believe we can achieve more than we can in the time that we have. So do be mindful of that, which is one of the reasons why you shouldn't do this kind of work on your own. So use it, do it with your team, with your sponsor of the PMO, uh, maybe with a couple of the project managers to really understand what is it that we're trying to achieve. With the MOT, that's going to give you a sense of where you are now. 
So think about, reflect, identify where do you want to be in the future? And then you'll start to be able to see the gap and some of the things that can really help you to, to kind of get to that next level. And on the bottom there, and we will share the, the slides with you, so you will have all of these links that I'm going to show you. Um, you can go to that website and you can just simply download for free uh, that MOT test uh, for your PMO, which you can then uh, have a go with. Uh, before I finish off and we look at questions, I just want to say continue the conversation uh, both internally with your own colleagues, but also with, with me at Wellington. So like I said, you can find me if you search for PMO Ninjas anywhere. Um, PMOs, I believe, work in the background. We're quite stealthy. Uh, we're sometimes quite ruthless in the way that we do things. We don't give our, our, our customers all the sweets on day one. The way that we plan has to be quite clever. Um, we have lots of different tools at our disposal. So that's why PMO Ninjas uh, and some of the things we've talked about is going to help you to get on that path. So do keep the conversation going. And then just for fun, uh, one of the thing, one of the other things that you can do is if you go to that link there, you can actually do a little bit of a quiz that kind of talks about what arcade machine is your PMO. I'm going to give you some context about this. Now, I mentioned that I run our annual conference. I theme that conference every year. This year, the conference theme is Level Up Your PMO. So we're going for a kind of retro arcade machine uh, a theme uh, at the conference and one of the things that we always do is just put something fun out there into the world that maybe helps us not to take our PMOs quite so seriously. Uh, so go on to futurepmo.com and you'll be able to do this quiz which arcade game is your PMO and you'll find out if maybe you're more like Donkey Kong or maybe Mario Kart or maybe Sonic or Mario Brothers uh, and there are some companion articles that we are releasing on that uh, as well to give you more information about how to be more Mario Kart or if you're already Mario Kart what you can do to take your PMO to the next level. That's it from me. So I think we're going to go to questions now. So I, um, I'm going to stop sharing so that, you know, hopefully we can you can see me and let's go through some of the questions that we do. Um, so um, do we do we want do you guys want to read out the questions or do you want me to just go through them? Um, sure. Uh, let me read out the question, Emma. The first question is coming from Bob. It is about uh, where would you place dispute resolution in the PMO and what would it look like? So dispute resolution is a really interesting topic um, because there's an element of organizationally we need to be able to manage that as a PMO um, to kind of deal with any problems that, that might arise. But there's also an element of emotional intelligence here within the individuals in the PMO as well. So it has to be a really clear balance. Uh, it takes a lot of maturity to kind of, you know, have a team that's like, you know, when there's a dispute or there's a problem where you just fly these people in and they're going to fix the problem and then fly back out again. It takes a lot of maturity to do that. Uh, I do have one team uh, that I work with and they do have that. They are a very mature organization and they call it the tiger team. So when something isn't quite right and there's a dispute, whether it's priorities or resources or something's gone wrong, they send the tiger team in, <laughs> which is, you know, yeah, some people like it, some people hate it. So it takes a lot of maturity on everybody's part to be able to do this well. In the beginning of a PMO's life, probably we're not really going to do this in a structured way. Uh, it, then it's about having the people in the PMO with the, the right training and the right level of emotional intelligence who can actually sit down and kind of be that conduit to resolve an issue. The reality of most is that when it is an issue relating to technical delivery, usually that get, gets escalated to a sponsor or somebody senior in the C-suite to make a prioritization decision. So there's a few different skills that we need as PMO people. First, we need to know, you know communication and influencing skills. We need to be quite skilled at that. Uh, we need to be able to read the room as well. So there's a little bit of business acumen that we need to kind of understand and be able to navigate our political landscape a little bit as well. Um, but there's also that kind of analytical perspective as well of gathering as much information because we know that a lot of the time the final decision is going to rest with somebody else. We can put in front of them the information, uh, but actually it comes back to that. So it, like I said, it will look like in the beginning individuals being skilled at, at uh, conflict resolution and us having given them the training and the development in that space. That's really important. Um, but then later on, usually, then we can kind of systemize it a little bit more. So almost have something ready to go, have a package ready to go if something does go wrong. Hopefully that's helped, Bob. Sure. Thanks, Emma. The next question is mainly about the uh, PMO role. PMO role traditionally looked as an enablement role. 
now to drive this uh, innovative PMO, uh, the the PMO need to be in the driver seat too, right? So if a uh, question is again, how do uh, the PMO can move from enablement role to a driver role? And the associated question is, if that happens, right, will it uh, conflict with the program management or the program director role who are actually in the driver seat? Yeah, uh, that's a really good question. Um, so um, effectively, you're right. The PMOs in many cases are drivers of project management practice. And when we talk about PPM project management, we're kind of looking at the sphere of project programs and portfolios usually. So um, historically, we we're very much seen as enablers. We're an enabling function uh, very much around the infrastructure that projects work with. And nowadays we are seeing more PMOs that want to drive that conversation. They want to drive the culture of change. So for me, the way to get to that is to build, start to build those relationships. It always comes down to building relationships. It is not anymore about command control. It is about having the relationships so we are trusted enough to be seen as that driver. In terms of that program management or program director role, that's a really interesting question because it depends on the structure and where the PMO actually sits. So, for example, if the PMO exists to support a program, then the chances are they're not going to ever become the drivers. They're not going to be doing lots of capability work and things like that. They're going to be very more focused on delivering. If it is a permanent office, however, then chances are they have more of a centralized role. So it's not necessarily then about conflicting, but working with the program management, with the program director to make sure that we have the right approaches in place to really deal with uh, that particular program and how that's going to do. One of the things that we see a lot, that I see a lot, um, is around the concept of, well, a program is just a big project, right? And it isn't. We know from the definitions in, in the body of knowledge, you know, a program is a collection of projects and business as usual that are kind of driving towards some beneficial change. That usually means a culture change or a behavioral change that we want to see. So we need to be very mindful, very clear on the roles and responsibilities, you know, within that program. If the PMO sits outside of that program, you know, who is managing the change management? Is that somebody that sits inside or outside? Do our structures and our processes and our tooling support program management as much as they support project management? Or are we just kind of using it as a kind of rolling up function? We're still trying to do things in a project way, but just escalating up to that next level. So I don't think it necessarily conflicts, although I take the point that sometimes it does. And most of the time, that's usually because the roles aren't clearly enough defined, so people tread on each other's toes, but also the relationships aren't strong enough to kind of deal with that. Hopefully that helps. Sure. Thanks, Emma. The next question coming from CN Compulsion. Uh, Compulsion, uh, uh, I have unmuted your mic. You can ask your question about the EI. Yes, good morning, everyone. Um, so just on the point of EI, um, I know it's an emerging topic and it's, it's quite complex um, in its own right. I suppose, how do you measure and I suppose improve EI in teams? I know you hit on it there on a previous question. So just if you have any input on that, it'd be brilliant. Thanks. Yeah, hi, hi Kian, nice to meet you. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, so yes, you're right. Emotional intelligence is a myriad of different things. Um, and so how how I tend to, so that there's a number of different things. So first of all, there are competence frameworks out there that exist uh, that kind of help us to measure that. Um, so at Wellington, we have a specific competence framework which is designed for PMO people. Uh, and how that works, if I give you that example, um, is effectively we do it in a kind of coaching environment. So we get, I get brought in as a performance coach um, and each individual in the team maybe will have a day's worth of coaching with me. So we break that down into eight hours, let's say. And um, as part of that, the first ask, the first part of it is to kind of get to know that individual. And we do some testing around some key things. First, they do some self-reflection, so some self-testing, if you like, or self-answering of, of questions. And then we kind of sit down and actually work through what that really means. And then over time, through the coaching process, we actually identify areas for that person to be able to kind of get to that next level. Um, and then we work together over a period of time. The thing with emotional intelligence is that um, it's obviously very individual and um, some people um, are very easy, uh, very easily changeable if you like they're kind of more malleable in the sense of right we need to work on this this and this whereas other people are more set in in their own kind of ways of being um so in terms of 
getting people through that coaching process what we then do at the end of that coaching process is we kind of go through the assessment if you like again to really understand where were we and where are we now so what we should see if everything's gone correctly is we should see an uplift in that person's either knowledge or experience in terms of that uh, that emotional intelligence and that comes in both uh, how they educate how they're educated and educate themselves and if they particularly emotional intelligence i think it's a very personal thing so have they engaged with that process is a really important part uh, secondly have they experienced a, how many have they experienced situations where they've actually we've really had to pull on that competence uh, or are they you know generally day to day are we just kind of you know not really having to pull on that or where are the situations where they have had to really think about a situation before reacting to something or responding to something I should say um, so we tend to encourage that coaching element um, but it, it should be done by somebody that knows what they're doing particularly on the the kind of more individual traits if you like the more individual competencies like emotional intelligence and communication skills and leadership skills and working uh, within a team and individually uh, ethics and professionalism all sit within that realm so they're all quite personal um, so we do need to make sure that unlike the technical competencies or even the strategic competencies to some way that there is somebody skilled that can help people on that journey uh, so hopefully that's helped Kian. Yeah it's brilliant thanks it's kind of a bit of a, a passion area of mine emotional intelligence and project management and <laughs> obviously know it's, it's growing in popularity yeah no it's brilliant thanks for to get your perspective yeah, on that. It, I mean, for me, it's, it's one of the things that I've been interested in my whole life, which is why I, I do what I do. Uh, and if you if you find me on social media, you'll see that a lot of the stuff that I post is we talk about uh, and at Wellington, we talk about human first. So hashtag human first. So we always talk to the humans before we we're, before we talk to the PMO people. <laughs> yeah, no, it's brilliant. And I just read a paper there recently. You know, it said fundamentally it's people, not processes, the driver projects. So um, absolutely. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's very important. Um, and thanks for your time. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, uh, Emma. Uh, next question is coming from the Greg Newman. Uh, Greg, I would, would you like to ask your question? Um, yeah, hello, Emma. Thank you. Very good chat today. Um, one question I have just from the PMO side of things where you have the, the aspect of records retention. Mm -hmm. It's the place people look to, to historical projects that may have been similar and you know, good for costing and risks and such like. Is there any, a lot of people these days kind of using maybe a combination of Google Drive or SharePoint or Teams chat or Gtalk, Gchat, even social media channels creeping in these times for communication and keeping things moving. Is there any single sort of um, tool or system that can be used to collect all that together and help the PMO maintain that as a searchable resource? Yeah, so um, I, I'm going to declare my interest. Uh, so we're a Microsoft house, so we deploy Microsoft technology. So uh, I can give you examples of what we've done with clients. We don't tend to work in the in the Google, but I I know that Google do, has a lot of very similar kind of functionality. So you're absolutely right. Technology has exploded, particularly collaboration technology. Um, so there's stuff everywhere. So one of the key things that we need to do when when we work with clients is first of all identify what are the vehicles that we're actually going to switch on. And if we're going to switch on various, we then need to make it clear to people what each of those tools are actually for. <laughs> so literally like a document that says this is what you use OneDrive for. This is what you use SharePoint for. This is what you use Teams chat for. This is what team files are for, um, because otherwise everybody's kind of just confused by the myriad of things they're getting bombarded in. And you like you say, you end up with lots of information in lots of different places. So the first thing I would say is identify what vehicles you have and then make it clear to people what each one of those vehicles is supposed to be used for. Um, I've seen all sorts of messes, as you can imagine. Um, so in terms of then grabbing data from other places, so most uh, collaboration technology now saves a lot of the information into like a, a specific folder and kind of archives it. So one of the things that we've done on occasion is we've actually kind of created a bit of a script that searches through that and a lot, you know, obviously with the permission of, of people in the company, but it kind of searches through and pulls out keywords so that when people have talked about a specific project in a chat, we're able to actually pull that. Typically, we would put it into a big old SharePoint list. Um, and I'm like I say, I know that Google Drive has similar capabilities. Um, 
And so we would put it in there. So that then straight away makes it searchable. Um, but it, I totally get your point. It is, um, especially since the pandemic and the rise of all of this collaboration technology and everybody implemented everything just because they had to do something. Um, so, yeah, I would say, first of all, create some clarity around the vehicles that you have. And then secondly, uh, make sure that there are ways to grab all that data and put it in one place so at least you can search it through. Uh, particularly, I would say less the chat and more the files and because the files do tend to be put in lots of different places. I think that's where the risk is, is when we start losing versions and our configuration management then goes to pop. So hopefully that's, that's helped a little bit. But yeah, without knowing more about your environment, uh, it's hard for me to, yeah. to say. Thank you. Just just setting the guidelines is really, I think, what PM yeah. was do. That's good. Yeah. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. Nice to meet you. Yep, likewise. Bye. Thank you. The next question is coming from Deirdre McCarthy. Uh, just uh, two minutes left out. Probably this can be the last question, I believe. Uh, go ahead, uh, Deirdre. OK, um, one of the points you made, Emma Ruth, was about sort of democratising sharing of information. Yeah. Um, I've worked with a couple of public sector organisations and I've found that there's often resistance, yep. often from the person who would actually benefit the most by sharing their information because they have huge amounts of information. Yep. Have you any tips for overcoming that? Yes, so it's really interesting you say that. A, because we have a Bob on the call, and I'm sure Bob isn't like this at all. Um, <laughs> that, that always makes me smile. Um, <laughs> sorry, Bob. Um, but yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I had somebody um, who I used to work with years ago, and he was always very reticent to share information and then he retired and then I contacted him for something and he went yeah now that I'm retired there's no risk to me so I'm happy to share everything that I know and that was a really interesting like wake up call for me because I, I had the exact that exact experience where it was like wow okay that he's actually said that out loud um so we actually did a networking event a few a couple of months ago to talk about this and and we talked about the fact that at some point we're dealing with the human but we also need to consider the ego so we need to allow people to be in that safe space and that community building that community infrastructure can be a really good place because they don't feel like we're just trying to grab information out of them but they're actually in a situation where they can choose to share in that safe space and they'll feel like they're actually helping somebody else that has a problem or a challenge that they need to deal with right now so actually putting them in that kind of space where giving them almost that that responsibility play to the ego you know with your experience then you can almost mentor these people who are newer coming in so they're more likely to then share some of the snippets um but yeah having that that community infrastructure is probably the best way that i've seen it because it gives them a different responsibility with that knowledge rather than it just being very protected uh, but i've had that exact conversation uh and i'll send santosh a link to the article that we wrote after we did that networking event because it was a really fascinating uh, conversation as you can imagine excellent thank you no worries yeah thanks a lot thanks Emma. uh thanks a lot uh, thanks all they are all great questions and got a lot of insights into this uh, topic too let me share my screen again uh first of all uh, the thanks again uh, for joining this webinar as you all know you will get a pdu for attending this webinar the pdu claim code is shown on the screen if you are registered with your PMI ID and uh, the email and user the same email to log into this event too, then uh, you will get the, uh, the PDU credit automatically allocated to you in the, in the system. Uh, if not, then you can still claim the, your PDUs through the code that is shown on the screen. I'm sure you got the value from this webinar and got implementable actions uh, to take away and uh, to try in your project and the programs. I wish you all the best and you have a nice day. Bye now.